Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Jeremiah 25. We're also in Mark chapter 11, the triumphal entry. Now, Mark chapter 11 is not very long. Well, 33 verses. Jeremiah 25 is a substantial chapter, and there's a lot here to take in, so let's pray and let's go. Mm -hmm. Lord, thank you for your word. We pray again. That you'd open our hearts, Lord. Please change us and lead us and correct us. Please teach us. Please forgive us. Um, we pray that you would help us to walk according to the Spirit. That you would show us what it means to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. That you would help us to be transformed, truly transformed by the renewing of our minds. Lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Hold on a minute. Kim had a chin. So it goes Jehoiakim, Jeho Jehoiachin, and then Zedekiah at the end. But Jehoiakim, that's going back a bit. In the last one, we were talking about Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, mm. and well, Jeconiah and Jehoiak, the son of Jehoiakim, that's taking place in 597 BC. This is 605 BC. 605 BC. Well, that's because we're counting back. We're counting down, aren't we? Before Christ, mm. so 605 is before. Is further back. Then 597. Now, 605 BC, by the way, is the year of a very famous battle. It's a battle between two empires, a battle between Pharaoh Nico on the one hand, Pharaoh Nico was the Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he was a very powerful man, and Nebuchadnezzar on the other hand, who was the king of the new empire rising, the Babylonian Empire. This is the same year, if you remember it, where Jeremiah, we're going to get to that, where Jeremiah sends Barak, and there's the famous cutting of the scroll. Okay, so some of that story is going to come later, and this just introduces you to a fact about Jeremiah, that Jeremiah is not, at this point, in chronological order. Everything's not neatly arranged according to sequence in time. Mm. Um, but so, if you can be oriented by that. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem for 20... Th now, here comes the, the message from God. You ready? Um, for 23 years... Actually, this is from Jeremiah. Sorry. I guess it's from God through Jeremiah. For 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of... Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, although the Lord persistently sent you, sent to you all his servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord, your, the Lord has given you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them, or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. So that was the message through all those prophets from the Lord. Now Jeremiah continues, Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, 
because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these surrounding nations. Okay, stop there for a second. A couple of things to notice. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Mm. That's almost like saying Hitler, my servant. Mm. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was not a nice guy. And he did not have good intentions for the people of God. And he wasn't kind to them. Like, he slaughtered them. Mm. And he took a lot of them away into captivity. And yes, Daniel became his chief man. But there wasn't out of the goodness of Nebuchadnezzar's heart. And now in the end, maybe God saved Nebuchadnezzar. Mm. I know our friend John MacArthur believes... He was saved, and others too believe that Nebuchadnezzar was saved. Um, I have my doubts about that, but I, I'm willing to um, concede that they may be right. Um, and there's good reason why they say they think he was saved in the end. And you can listen to their arguments, read the notes in the MacArthur Study Bible, and so on. But here's the, here's the thing. The king of Babylon, my servant, at this point is God's servant to do what? To destroy Judah, to destroy the armies of Judah, to destroy the, destroy the pride of the people of God, to humble them, to bring them low, to bring them down, mm -hmm. even to see the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem and to see them removed from the land. So this was... Nebuchadnezzar at this point is God's servant to discipline. Now this is helpful, by the way, when you realize um, just how fully God is in control. We need to get this firmly in our mind. When things go badly wrong, has God lost control? Okay, so if God is still in control, even let's say there's someone in the church who rises up and they're divisive and they're, and they and they are causing terrible trouble and making life miserable for the pastors and lots of people in the church and things like that you say well hold on a minute has god lost control is this just the devil kind of gaining the upper hand over god well no <laughs> that's good to know isn't it interesting because in all situation. There are people like our friend MacArthur who believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh was an individual, a demon-inspired individual who led the rebellion, you would say, against Paul's influence and the and the all the misery that came from the false accusations about Paul and the, the trouble for the church in Corinth. Uh, that the, this, this was a particular individual who was behind it and at the root of it and three times God, Paul asked God to take him out of the way the reason they believe he was an individual is because Paul uses the word angel messenger of Satan um, and, to, and, and, and you say well why is God allowing a demon-inspired man, or if you take the other situation that people think, a, a demonically originated illness for Paul, a thorn in the flesh, If why would God allow that? And you say, well, actually, it's explained there in 2 Corinthians. To keep me from exalting myself. So to keep Paul humble... To, in other words, to discipline him in advance for potential pride, <laughs> to keep him from being exalting himself and ruining everything, God allowed it and said, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, in this situation, 
God is using Nebuchadnezzar to humble and to bring down and to refine and to discipline and to bring about his purposes for his people. And so Nebuchadnezzar is his servant. In every situation that we face, even the devil is God's devil. Even the devil is under the, the ultimate restraint of God, like in Job. He can only afflict us. He can only do what he wants if God allows it. So who do we have to fear? God, right? Don't, don't get to thinking, oh no, the devil's got the upper hand. Uh, you know, oh, God's losing. God would, God would not let this happen to me, but somehow the devil tricked, the devil got in. No, if we face difficulty, if we face trouble, if we face disaster, we need to humble ourselves and seek God and say, God, you've allowed this. And trust him. And we trust that God can restrain it. You see that. And even God can turn it for good. You see that with Daniel in Nebuchadnezzar's court, don't you? That even in the middle of the discipline, God can turn it for good and bring about good purposes from it and through it. So, praise the Lord. Okay. Um... <laughs> So, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, um, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against these surrounding nations. Oh, so Nebuchadnezzar is not just destroying Judah. No, he's judging all the surrounding nations, places like Edom and Moab and the Philistines and so on. I will devote them, as talking about all those who've been mentioned, to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish them from I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now, these nations include Judah. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. Oh, interesting. Now, just a quick side note. Do you remember Daniel chapter 9? Mm. You remember when Daniel was reading Jeremiah? Mm. And he says he was reading Jeremiah the prophet and he realized that the captivity would be for 70 years. Now it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's implied here. Because God says in verse 20, then after 70 years are completed. In other words, it's the completion of the 70 years of captivity means that the captivity is going to come to an end. It doesn't say in this verse, after 70 years, I'll let them go home. But Daniel realized, hey, God's got a plan for 70 years of captivity. We're nearly at 70 years, he says. Actually, it'll be 68 years when um, Cyrus allows them to return. And it's very interesting because that people say, well, well, then how's it 70 years? Well, if you add in 60, if you start at 68 and then you add in the time for the message to be sent out to all the different regions within the kingdom of the, the now Medes and the Persians with Cyrus at the head. And then if you take add a little bit of time for them to prepare to make the journey and then about five months for them to make the journey it works out about 70 years before they got to return hmm. that makes jeremiah a very accurate prophet doesn't it anyway where are we halfway through verse 12 halfway through well, verse 12. No, you finished verse 12 so. verse 13 i will bring on upon that land all the words that i have uttered against it Everything written in this book which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall make slaves even of them. 
and I will recompense them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. Now, them is the Babylonians, and it's so interesting, isn't it? Because at the time when Jeremiah wrote this, well, it's dated, 605 BC, the nation in the whole world that was on the up, the up-and-coming empire was the Babylonians, and there weren't any others. So the, the Persians and the Medes, who later were going to take over from the Babylonians, were being conquered by the Babylonians. They'd just been conquered, so they, they, were, they were out of the picture. And, and the Egyptians were, had just been conquered at the Battle of Carchemish. They were out of the picture. The big nation, the big one on the, the big man on the block was Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. So how could Jeremiah see ahead? Well, it's a, it's a God thing, isn't it? It's a prophecy. And I wonder if Daniel, when he's reading this, got a thrill of excitement when he had his visions and he realized, hey, God is giving me the details about which he spoke here. And Daniel had his vision of the, 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 the idol with the gold, head of gold and the arms and chest of silver and so on. And Daniel got the details. Okay, verse 15. Thus says the Lord, thus the Lord... Uh, the God of Israel said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom, you, to whom I send you drink it. Hold on a minute. The cup of the wine of wrath. What does that remind you of? Well, that's a picture, actually, that became like a, a phrase. And Jesus in the garden said, in Gethsemane, said, you know, unless this, if it's possible, if there's any other way except that this, I drink this cup, let it pass from me. In other words, I don't want to drink the cup of the wine of your wrath. That's where this picture comes from. Who's, who, with whom was the wrath that f filled the cup that Jesus drank? Okay, with me, with every Christian, right? So that your sins were, you would say, making God angry, full of wrath. And it was all stored up. And it's like there's a cup full of the wrath of God. And Jesus says, if, if there's any other way except that I drink this, let it pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. And then... He doesn't get an answer. In other words, the answer is, there is no other way. And Jesus goes ahead and he drinks the cup. Well, there's no literal cup. But there was a literal punishment for Jesus, isn't there? The wrath of God poured out upon our Saviour on the cross. Now in this case, this is where the picture comes from. Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So the cup is also going to be, you would say, um, executed by a sword. War is going to come to them. Verse 17, so I took the cup from the Lord's hand. Now, is this all in a vision? Or did God appear in some way and actually give Jeremiah a cup? Well, so I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. Now, if you read the MacArthur Study Bible, it says, obviously, he couldn't have gone to all these nations. You're going to see a list in a minute. And I was looking at that earlier and thinking, well, I don't know. Maybe they know something that I don't know. But um, I figured the best way I could interpret it would be to say... Yeah, Jeremiah had a cup and he went round all these nations and he said, you've got to drink this. Because look at what it says next. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and officials, to make them a desolation and a waste, hissing and a curse as, is, as at this day. Pharaoh, so that's, he goes to Jerusalem and then he goes to Egypt. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his officials, all his people, 
and all the mixed tribes among them, all the kings of the land of Uz, and the kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. That's interesting because Pharaoh Semeticus had conquered Ashdod after a long siege in this time. And he. it's interesting that Jeremiah uses, or God uses the phrase, the remnant of Ashdod. What remains of Ashdod, in other words, which was not a great deal back then. Edom, Moab, the sons of Ammon, all the kings of Tyre, all the kings of Sidon, all the kings of the coastland across the sea, Dedan, Tima, Buzz, and all who cut the corners of their hair, maybe an Arabic tradition, all the kings of Arabia and all the kings of the mixed tribes who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, all the kings of Media, all the kings of the north, far and near, one after another, and all the kingdoms of the world that are on the face of the earth. Maybe that's why um, MacArthur and others say Jeremiah couldn't have done this. But um, I'm just reminded of Philip appearing and disappearing in different places. We don't get the story, do we, of what happened? But I think it's possible... And Jonah took a ride in the belly of a fish. That was a bit of a shortcut to Nineveh for Jonah after he'd gone the opposite direction. We'll know when we get to heaven whether this was literally fulfilled or whether this all happened in the vision. And um, I'll let you decide what you think. I'm going to take it literally for my, set, for my part. And just trust that the Lord had him do this. Because... The reason I say that is, um, at the end it says, and after them the, the king of Babylon shall drink. Now verse 27. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink, be drunk, and vomit. Fall and rise no more because of the sword that I am sending among you. And if they refuse to accept the cup from your hand to why would God say that if it was in a vision? It seems strange to me if it wasn't literal that God would actually say this to Jeremiah, if they, ref if they refuse the cup from your hand to drink. Then you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, you must drink, for behold, I begin to work disaster at the city that is called by my name. And shall you go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. You, therefore, shall prophesy against them all these words and say to them, The Lord will roar from on high and from his holy habitation utter his voice. He will roar mightily against his fold, and shout like those who tread grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. The clamor will resound to the end of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against the nations. He is entering into judgment with all flesh, and the wicked he will put to the sword, declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster is going forth from nation to nation, and a great tempest is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. And those pierced by the Lord on that day shall extend from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall be dung on the surface of the ground. Wail, you shepherds, and cry out and roll in ashes, you lords of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and dispersion have come, and you shall fall like a choice vessel. No refuge will remain for the shepherds, nor escape for the lords of the flock. A voice, the cry of the shepherds, and the wail of the lords of the flock. For the Lord is laying waste their pasture, and the peaceful folds are devastated because of the fierce anger of the Lord, like a lion. He has left his lair, for their land has become a waste because of the sword of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Whoa. Okay, so 
did this happen literally to Jeremiah? I mean, can you imagine for a moment? Jeremiah turning up in Egypt. However he got there. Maybe spirited there by the Lord. And just walking in to the presence of Pharaoh. And we're going, who's this? And Jeremiah says, I have a cup for you to drink. It's from Yahweh. It's from the Lord. And, and they knew who that was, the God of the Hebrews. And, you, and, and, and if, he, if they drank of it, and can you imagine Jeremiah turning up at all these kings? And if they drank, he would say, drink and be drunk and vomit. Fall and rise no more because of the sword that I am sending among you. <laughs> Ailey. Yes, it wasn't for you, Ailey. I'm sorry. But I met, that, that would have been pretty scary stuff for Jeremiah, wouldn't it? Remember at the beginning of Jeremiah where the Lord says, I'm setting you over nations and kingdoms and to build up and to, and, and to, to destroy, to tear down. So, See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is God doing that. And I don't know if it was a vision, but I'm going to take it literally and imagine Jeremiah um, turning up in the courts of these kings who may be spirited there by the Lord, or maybe he just has to walk in and God just opens the doors providentially. God makes them say, it was, there's a guy turned up from Israel with a message for you, Pharaoh, with a message for you, king of Edom, and, and, and he's got a cup and he wants you to drink from it. Probably poison, don't drink from it. Mm -hmm. All right, clean the cup. Now, okay, I'll drink from it. Or, no, I won't drink from it. All right, this is the message of, from God for you. You're going to fall. You're going to be judged. You're going to die. Why? Because I've decided, says God, that this is the time I'm going to judge the earth, the whole earth. There's going to be a sword. There's going to be disaster. I've decreed it, says God. Now, does this remind you of something? I mean, this is like the message that we have, isn't it? For our age, God has appointed a day when he is going to judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And, and judgment is coming. And, and we have the duty to take this message to everybody and to say, look, God is serious. He's going to judge the world. Okay. Oh, I could spend the whole day there in Jeremiah chapter 25, but let's go to Mark chapter 11. And again, thankfully this is familiar territory, so let's get into it. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany and the, and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut down from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, which means save, Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it was identifying him as the one who comes in the name of the Lord, in other words, the Messiah. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. In other words, this is the son of David, and this is the promised Messiah. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance 
a fig tree and leaf, he went to it to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Now that's a little bit like Nehemiah, isn't that? Mm. Saying, don't carry anything. Mm. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Now that's interesting because just for that one brief moment, the king was in the temple Mm. and he took over. So interesting, isn't it? There's this moment where Jesus says, no, you can't do that. And nobody can stop him. And that's interesting as well because he could have just carried on at that point, couldn't he? He could have just said, okay, this is my takeover. All you people, are you with me? Right, let's deal with these Pharisees, let's deal with these scribes, let's deal with the Sadducees. And he could have had the support of people who wanted, oh, what did they want? They wanted a Messiah to take over and to boot out the Romans. But Jesus wasn't going to meet that desire now. He'd come to pay the price for sin. But the people of Israel, whose hearts really were still with the ideology of their leaders, were about to reject him. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Interesting, the day before it had shown promise of fruit. The leaves were there, even though it wasn't the time for figs. And normally the leaves appear and the figs are there and... Um, so it kind of showed from a distance that it should have fruit. When Jesus got there, there wasn't any. And that's a bit like the people of Israel, isn't it? They should. They looked like they should have fruit, but there wasn't any. Anyway, it had withered away to its roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God, and truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... You think he was gesturing towards the mountain of Jerusalem. Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. Now just take that, if you take nothing else from anything I've said today, and remember it. When you stand praying, when you stand praying, when you stand praying, when I stand praying, what are we supposed to do? Forgive. Don't hold grudges. Don't be the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18. If someone sinned against you, forgive them. Let it go. Because God has forgiven you in the way that we've been forgiven. We're supposed to be forgiven. We didn't deserve it. Okay, they don't deserve it. Forgive them. That's our general attitude. And don't, don't be the person who's trying to ask God for stuff whilst you're um, holding grudges and resentment towards other believers. That's terrible. Verse 27, And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. 
And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, they were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So, so they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Lord, we thank you that we have such uh, a clear picture of just how wonderful, how wise, how right you are. That we can trust you, that we can entrust ourselves to you. Lord, we love you, we want to follow you. And we realise that if we were there, we probably would have been among those getting it wrong. Misunderstanding you, expecting the wrong things and not trusting you rightly. But Lord, we praise you that you've given us all this revelation. Help us in the light of it all to really trust you. And help us to hold out the message of hope and salvation and forgiveness through, through you. At the same time as warning people that you've fixed a day. A day on which you will judge the world with justice by the man you have appointed. That the, the wrath that people are storing up against the day of wrath will be poured out on this world. And Lord, we pray that you would have mercy and save many. Save the lost, we pray. Help us to shine the light. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Alright, we're done. God bless you. And we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow for more. It's exciting stuff, isn't it, Jeremiah? God bless you. Bye-bye for now.